Psalter this morning is Psalter 139. It's found on page 854 and 855, verses 1 through 18. Are we there? 854. Okay, I don't hear any more pages, so we're going to start. Let's read our response together. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down, and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it altogether. You pursue me behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such a knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Whether shall I go from your spirit? Or whether shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in shallow, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, let only darkness cover me, and the light about me be night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day. For darkness is as light with you. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for you are fearful and wonderful. Wonderful are your works. You know me very well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was being made in secret, intricately wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written the days that were formed for me, every day before they came into being. How profound to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! If I count them, they are more than the sand. When I wake, I am still with you. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Amen. Amen.
believe you. I believe somebody loves to praise God's holy name. For truly God is worthy. He's worthy. Amen. Woke us up. Amen. Started us. Gave us minds. Stayed on the Lord. Amen. Yes, yes. Hallelujah. We just thank God for, for that musical selection this morning. And now we prepare to offer our gifts to the Lord. And so let us pray this offering, prayer saints, together. <coughs> Gracious God, in awe of your presence, we offer our gifts today. Just as you intimately know us, help us understand and trust in your vastness. As we reflect on our beliefs, may our stewardship reflect our trust in your guiding hand. Guide us to embody our creed. Living as a community of faith in love, service, and action. Bless these offerings as a symbol of our commitment to live out our beliefs. Amen. Amen. As Arisha comes forward, if you're able, please stand.
Anybody glad? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Anybody glad? Thought you were worth saving. Thought you were worth dying for. Witnesses mm. to tell of God's mercy yes. and to Thank tell of God's grace. Mm. Hallelujah. As you see the sermon title on the screen and it reflects on the Psalter. And that's why we didn't have the scripture lesson read again. Because it talks about in that text that we're fearfully and wonderfully made by our God. Let us pray. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope, and my will be lost in thine. God, we've come to you right now this morning here to praise you and thank you for giving your son Jesus to die for us, to sacrifice his life for us. Thanking you, God, right now that you formed us and, and loved us even from the very beginning. And that is why the death was necessary. And that's why we're so grateful for the resurrection. God, right now, I ask that you anoint my lips that I may speak what thus says the Lord. Touch my heart and soul so that I feel your holy presence. God, bless your precious children that they here today will glorify your name as you exalt your very presence. God, right now, send your spirit in this place. God, let your power fill these temples so that prophetic proclamation is easy and that we're inspired, God, to go out and do your work in this world. God, we thank you right now as you build our faith. And it's in Jesus' name we pray and ask it all. Amen. 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 The story is told of a great grand church that had a great grand organ. The organ was integral to the church's services. They played it. All the time, call to worship, opening prayer, you know the drill, the opening litanies, and the organ was a central part of the church's life. Well, time began to take a toll on the organ, and the notes began to weaken, and the pitch began to get off, and eventually the organ stopped working. The church was in despair and they immediately called in professionals and experts to fix the organ, but no one could do it. Finally, they put an ad in the paper and the day after the ad ran, an older gentleman showed up to fix this organ. They were a little perplexed, didn't know how in the world. We've called in experts from all over. They can't do it. How? Can you do it? He said, let me see the instrument. They took him to the organ. He smiled. And he started working. He started tinkering. And by the time the day was over, the organ was fixed. The church was overjoyed. And the preacher was dumbfounded. He said, how in the world did you fix the organ when all the experts and professionals we called couldn't do it? And he said, well, I'm retired now, but in my former working life, I worked for Yamaha Organ Company. And so the reason I was able to fix that organ is because it was made by Yamaha. The reason I was able to fix that organ is because it was made by me. Saints of God, many of us need some fixing we need some tinkering. We need some tender love and care. We need some mending. Our hearts need easing. Our souls need lifting. Some of us, our identity has been warped 
and we've begun to think what the world says about us, that you're unimportant and you're insignificant and that your church will never do this and that you'll never do that and your God has forgotten you. And I know we look real good on the outside and we say everything is all right, but sometimes on the inside, things are going wrong and we can't admit it. And I don't, I don't say you can't tell your business to everybody. I'm not, I'm not telling you that. Everybody can't take your testimony. Everybody can't take what's going on. But before you give up, I want you to know that there's hope and there's help in God. We've got a God who's not retired. We've got a God who's the Alpha and the Omega. We've got a God that's the beginning and the end. We've got a God that's the first and the last. We've got a God that's the author and the finisher of our faith. And he is the author and the creator of us. So now is not the time to turn away. Now is not the time to give up. Now is not the time to dismiss God. But I'm preaching to somebody today to let you know that we serve a big, great God who sees us and knows us and cares for us. Mm -hmm. God is our constructor and our maker. And with that being said, you may ask, well, how do I adjust? How do I adjust my attitude? Preacher, how do I alter my limited view of how I see myself? And how I see my God. And well, I would tell you to take a walk with me and let's study the book of Psalm. Let's study King David. And I'm speaking to somebody today to let you know that as we study this psalm, you will discover how much your God not only loves creation, but you'll discover how much your God loves you. And so at the start of this psalm, it says, oh, Lord, and this isn't just any oh, Lord, don't miss it. This is God's personal name, Yahweh, Yahweh. It communicates his covenant making, covenant keeping nature of his people. This name specifically represents his steadfast love and faithfulness, his mercy, his judgment, and his commitment to never leave nor forsake us. This type of God is infinite in tenderness and personalness towards us. He searches us and he knows us. All of our anxious thoughts, all of our heavy thoughts, all of our prayers and petitions, all of our disappointments, all of our pains, all of our pressures, our God knows. And David needed God to know because David was going through. David had some pressure. David had some pain. David had some despair. He was being attacked and cursed and accused of being responsible for the murder of King Saul. And he was hemmed in by real enemies and real injustice. And he was appealing to God to please help. God wasn't going to leave him alone. And during this very difficult period in David's life, ultimately it's a hymn of praise. He's crying out to God, but ultimately he's saying, God, but you know. God, you know me. God, you know how much I can handle. God, you're aware of me. This psalm proclaims a relationship between God that is profoundly personal. This psalm describes in soaring fashion the omnipotence, meaning God has unlimited power. Talks about God's inescapability. You can't get away from God. You know that song. You can't hide from the Lord. He's going to find you. He, don't you run. He's going to find you. Don't you try to get away. God's going to find you. He's inescapable. Wherever you are, God is knows where you are. It talks about his omniscience. He knows everything. And so the psalm is divided into four sections. And but the, we can't, in the interest of time, we can't go over them all. But in sections one through six, verses one through six, we want to talk about the personalness of God. 
In this first section, we see King David describe God's unlimited knowledge. In these verses, you'll find an endearing God. He is not detached or aloof, but he possesses personal and intimate knowledge of us and is involved in our formation. Even before we were formed in our mother's wombs. I couldn't help but think of Jeremiah 1, 4, and 5. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. I sanctified you. Saints of God, God loves us before we were formed. God formed us before our mothers and fathers knew about us. God had us in the palm of his hand. He formed us, sanctified us, made us holy, brought us forth for his will and his glory. God's love and concern for us existed before we were even born. Yes. We are blessed, sisters and brothers. Yes. This isn't just a run-of-the-mill kindness. It, but it's incredible. It's beyond words. It's undeniable. God's love for us is exceedingly abundantly above all we could ask or think. It doesn't make logical human sense because we mess up. We fall short. We miss the mark. We fall from grace. I wish I had some help. Y'all know we're not perfect. We're not a perfect church. Sometimes we talk about each other. Sometimes we don't do what God tells us to do. Verses of Psalm 139 show us the far-reaching, all-encompassing nature of God's love. And the first six verses affirm that there's no aspect of our lives that God doesn't care about. Message version says in the first three verses, God, you've investigated my life. You've got all the facts firsthand. I'm an open book to you, God. Even from a distance, you know what I'm thinking. Verses 4 through 6 read like this in the New King James Version. For there's not a word on my tongue that you know it all together. You can't think to say anything and God doesn't know. You've hedged me from behind and before. Laid your hand on me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's too high. I cannot attain it. Beloved, there's no thought. There's no activity. There's no aspect. There's no event in our lives that God doesn't care about. There's no thought. I'm going to say it right more time. There's no activity. There's no aspect. There's no event in our lives that God doesn't care about. It's not too little. God doesn't think it's is significant. It's not too big. It's not too big for our God. God says, I know it all and I care. He cares about your life. He cares about your family. He cares about your health. He cares about your wealth. He cares about your finances. He cares about your state of mind. He cares about your emotional, spiritual well-being. He cares. There's nothing in your life too small or too large for our God. 17 and 18 verses, the psalmist writes, How precious are your thoughts towards me. How great is the sum of them. If I could count them, there'd be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. The wonder and the majesty of God's understanding and the interests of God in humanity are literally incomprehensible. His thoughts towards us more than the grains of sand. Think about what that really means with all God is doing, running the earth and keeping it on his axis and making the sun rise and making the moon come out at night and putting each star in place. His thoughts about you are more than the grains of sand. And it's important that we know that it's not because of our goodness, 
Not because we got it right. Not because we dotted every I and crossed every T. No, it's not because we've attained any personal moral success. His thoughts towards us are not given to make us think that we are great, but his actions towards us need to make us think about that hymn we sung, How Great Thou Art. He's focused on us. From the time we lay down to the time we wake up. And then there's a shift in 13 through 16. Says you formed me in my inward parts, covered me in my mother's womb. I'll praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. And I like verse 14. It says, I will praise you. Hallelujah. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. And that my soul knows right word. That word for praise in the Hebrew denotes both worship and thanksgiving. We praise God not just for what he's done, but we praise God for who he is. And that word fearfully means with great reverence. And wonderfully, that root word of wonderful means to be striking, to be different, to be unique, one of a kind. It means to be remarkable and sent by God. And some of us might think this might be saying something about the psalmist giving himself praise, may be a little narcissistic, may feel like it's a bit obsessive, but we got to realize that the primary focus of this verse is not on King David. It's not on what David is going through. It's not on David's life. It's not on David's ability. David's not saying, I admire me because I'm so fearfully and wonderfully made, but David is saying, I will praise my Yahweh, and I wonder if there's anybody in the house today that can say to yourself, self, you're fearfully and wonderfully made. Can you look in the mirror and say, self, you might be thin or you might be fluffy, but you're fearfully and wonderfully made. Self, you might be short or you might be tall, but you're fearfully and wonderfully made. Self, you may be melanin blessed. You may be caramel. You may be cocoa. You may be pecan tan. You may be chestnut. You may be mahogany, but you're fearfully and wonderfully made. Society might tell you something else. TV might tell you something else. The internet may tell you something else. These models that look like they ain't eight in 30 days may try to tell you something else. Please know it's Photoshop. It ain't real. They got pimples and blemishes and fat and sell you like just like everybody else. But you got to shut out those negative voices. You got to shut out what the world said. And you got to say, I am a sacred word. Hallelujah. And I will believe the report of the Lord. Saints of God, just the way God made you, just as you are, you're special and rare in the sight of God. And these truths may be hard to believe, may be hard to fathom, may be hard to accept, but I want to speak and let you know that your constructor, your maker, the maker of heaven and earth, says that you are amazing. You are God-given with a purpose and potential. So this isn't just a motivational message. Yes, I want you to know that you're fearfully and wonderfully made, but I also want to drive home the point that when God made you, he made you for a purpose. He met, when he made you, he didn't make any mistakes. When he made you, he broke the mold. When he made you, he made you to do something for the kingdom. And I also don't want you to take your great worth for granted. Because life sometimes tries to get in the way. Life tries to hinder your progress. Trust that God can use even your obstacles and turn them into opportunities. Your step back is simply a setup for your step forward, y'all. Your setback is simply a setup for your step forward. 
is a beautiful message from Mother Teresa. I'd like to read a snippet from it. She says, life is an opportunity. Benefit from it. Life is a beauty. Admire it. Life is bliss. Taste it. Life is a dream. Realize it. Life is a challenge. Meet it. Life is a duty. Complete it. Life is life. Fight for it. Sisters and brothers, there will always be those things that try to stop us, that try to block us, that try to thwart our journey. But we got to remember that we've been fearfully and wonderfully made not just to exist, not just to coast, not just to go along, to get along. But we were made by our Yahweh God to ultimately live so that his name gets the glory. He said we were worth saving. He sacrificed his life so that we can be free, so that we can be whole and tell everyone we know that God gets the glory, the honor, and the praise. So whenever you get weak and whenever you hit a wall, and whatever you, like runners do sometimes, they run it and they say they hit a wall and can't go any further. Whenever your energy begins to wane, whenever your faith begins to falter, whenever you feel weary, whenever you feel down with tears in your eyes, remember the God who made you is omnipotent. The God who made you knows you. The God who made you knows what you're going through. The God that made you has not retired. The God that made you is the Alpha, is the Omega, is the beginning, is the end, is the first, is the last, is the author and the finisher of our faith. By his power, he'll raise you, he'll save you, he'll pick you up, he'll turn you around, he'll place your feet on solid ground. the thoughts he has towards you. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you a future and a hope. So you can say to yourself, my Yahweh God cares about me, seeks me out, forms me, knows my heart and knows my soul. So I'm going to lift my voice and I'm going to raise a hallelujah and I'm going to lift my hand and re-sing that hymn we sung this morning. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. And that great God made you and you're fearfully and wonderfully. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, let the church say amen. 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 amen.